Good morning. I think specialty coffee has a challenge. In a world where there is seemingly unlimited information, but limited attention, and more and more people and businesses and organizations and bloggers and Twitterers and tweeters and Instagrammers are putting more and more information out there, the challenge for specialty coffee is to elevate itself above the noise. It's to communicate some meaning and to mean something to our audience, to our readers, to our customers. Specialty coffee, especially, is complex. It's not a simple subject. There's issues of quality and equality, of sustainability, of ecology, of global warming, of growth, of development. All these things are complicated issues, and they need to be communicated. And we need to take our customers and our audience with us. And I don't think that creating more and more noise and giving more and more information is necessarily the answer. Because when it comes down to it, there's only one way to really mean something to people and to take them with you on your journey, and that's to tell them a story. And speciality is in a wonderful situation because stories are baked into speciality coffee, if you like. They're stories of triumph and failure, of success, of friendships, of development, of innovation, of passion, of friendship, of working together, of partnerships, of people across the world. These are the raw materials and the building blocks of any good story. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is to give you some ideas and maybe to challenge you to tell your stories a little bit better and to give you some templates for telling those stories. But any story needs an audience. It needs someone to tell that story to. And for speciality, our audience is the customer. And coffee means different things to different people. To some, it's just a kickstart of the day, something you grab on the way to work. To others, it's a social thing. You go out to a cafe to meet friends, and coffee is just a thing you have when you're there. To others, it's a cafe is a space to work or a space to spend some time. And for others, it's a commodity. It's some, something you buy on the supermarket shelf and you just compare on price. And to others, it's an obsession. It's that feeling that you're going away for the weekend, you don't know how good the coffee's going to be, so you pack the AeroPress and your beans and your scales and your grinder and even some water, because you just don't know how it's going to, it's going to be. I can see some people nodding there with um, kind of recognition of that. So what we need to do is understand our customer, understand the audience. And typically, research will tell you that the first thing that people think about when they're getting a coffee is convenience. They just want it where they are at the moment. But we wanted to dig a bit deeper, and we publish uh, coffee guides and magazines. We wanted to understand what our reader was interested in, what the coffee customer wanted. So we asked a survey of about 70 different consumers in the UK, people who bought our guides and signed up to our newsletters, what was most important when choosing a cafe. And the results were quite interesting. 47% said serving specialty coffee was most important, and 44% said independence. So almost half and half split between specialty coffee and independence. Interestingly, food and service weren't that important. And what we teased out of this was that people like the quality element of speciality. And they might like the story element too, they like the thing that goes with it. It's not just a commodity to them. But they also like the independence, the artisan, the, the element that you're helping the little guy compete against the high street chains. And that's a useful thing to know about your audience when you're telling your story. But we also wanted to dig a little bit deeper. We wanted to know how these consumers would define themselves. So we asked, how interested are you in coffee? And we kind of created an obsession scale by accident. We asked them to categorize themselves into four groups. Those that don't really care. These are the people that just go where it's closest. Those who like coffee, but it's not that important. People who really enjoy it and search out new places. And those who are obsessive, the guys who take their press on holiday. And the interesting thing was no one didn't care. There were no respondents who said they don't care about coffee. So convenience isn't that much of an issue. 18% said they liked it, but it's not the most important thing. Over half said coffee was important to them and they searched out new places. And just under 30% said they were a fanatic. So this gives us a kind of indication of what our audience is interested in. And when you're telling a story, it's really useful to know about your audience and what triggers them and what they're motivated by, because that's going to help you in your storytelling journey. So if you look back to our coffee consumer again, we can see there's those who are passionate about it, those who obsess about it, but those who use it as a social occasion. We've got, a, if you like, a, an ecosystem of uh, customers, and we need to tell stories to these people. 
But first, before we go ahead, a story of my own. Now, like any good parent, I like to come home and read my kids a, a good night story. Um, often life gets in the way and it's just a glass of wine and a kiss on the cheek, and the wine's for me, by the way. But when I get the chance, I like to read a story. And my son, Billy, he's eight, he loves good stories too. And I tell him the story of Dr. Strompoodle, this amazing inventor. Now, I have to admit, Dr. Strompoodle isn't my invention. It's the invention of my dad. It's a story that my dad used to tell me when I was a child. Um, and that's my dad there, me and my brother, my dad. Now, this was the 70s. It was before the internet, so a leisure activity was painting a garden fence. But that's us. And nevertheless, I liked stories. So, and I can remember vividly the feeling of lying in bed, hearing the key turn in the lock, and my dad come upstairs, the feeling of his cold cheek kissing me because he's been outside in the cold night air, him sitting on the end of the bed and crushing my feet, and then telling me the story of Dr. Storm Poodle. And these stories were amazing. He, Dr. Storm Poodle, he was this fantastic inventor. He could do anything, but he was a bit disorganized, and he didn't really know how to get things done, so he had an accomplice, an assistant. And that was me. It was Dr. Strom Poodle and Nick, his trusty assistant. And he would tell me these stories of fighting a giant with one eye and escaping from the cave, of raising a slave army in rebellion against the evil overlords, and of winning the Football World Cup final with two Argentinian footballers. And they were amazing. And I was part of this story. I was flying around in these stories. And I can remember them vividly to this day. But some of you might be thinking, well, those stories sound a bit familiar. And I could never work out how my dad came home from work and would spin out these stories off the top of his head. How did he know them? They must be real. But of course, they weren't. The giant with one eye was the Cyclops from the Odyssey. The slave rebellion was really Spartacus. And the footballer was Osvaldo Ardiles and Ricky Villa, two Argentinians that played for my dad's favorite football team in the 70s. So he was using these stories, these archetypes, to give me a new version of the story, and I could understand them immediately. And, and that's the power of stories. You can harness these archetypes, these ideas that people have had before, because really, we're hardwired to understand stories. We're here because we've listened to stories. Our forefathers before us have not gone to see the saber toothed tiger. We've not eaten the red poisonous berries. We've listened to stories and survived to this day and we're hardwired to understand and put things in context. And stories allow you to imagine things you've never imagined, to see things you've never seen, to go places you've never gone. And that's the power that we have to take our customers with us on these journeys and tell them about the issues that affect our industry and our co companies and get them to believe us and get them to m remember us. One thing to remember, though, when you're telling a story is our customers have no interest in our businesses. We're working every day, we're passionate, we know everything about our business. When we get up in the morning, we're thinking about it. When our customers get up in the morning, they're not thinking about our business. They're thinking about their day. And the day probably looks a little bit something like this. Get up, make breakfast, get the kids to school, get the car out, go to work, refuel the car, remind your partner to fuel the car next time because they left it empty last time, go to work, prepare for a meeting, have lunch, have another meeting. It goes through the day, you get to the day, end of the day, you're tired, you have a glass of wine, you watch 10 minutes of Netflix, you think, oh, it might be nice to go out for a meal occasionally, and then you go to bed. Now, that's my life, because I've got kids. If you haven't got kids, there might be a bit more Netflix, a bit more wine, and you might actually go out for a meal occasionally. <laughs> but the point is, everyone has busy lives, and no one's really listening to us. So our challenge as business owners and marketers is that we're there standing in the dust with sweat in our eyes, fighting the fight to tell the story about our businesses. And when we get attention, we need to make damn sure that people remember us because we haven't got a lot of opportunities. And stories can help us do that. So if we look at the story and ask ourselves, what is a story? Sometimes it's easier to ask what isn't. And my colleagues in the editorial department at Food Magazine know what stories aren't, and they call them press releases. It's basically news. A new cafe opening isn't a story. A new roaster isn't a story. Even a new bean coming in from another part of the world isn't a story. It's a news item. It's ephemeral. It's no, there's no context. There's no narrative to it, and no one remembers it. But if you put that in the context of a narrative and a structure, then that story becomes memorable. People identify it, people engage, and you take them with you. So in terms of putting together stories, there's a useful sort of template, some useful ideas that we have. And there's a book called The Seven Basic 
plots by Christopher Booker, which is great. It basically condenses every single story ever told by human to seven different archetypes. And I'm going to take you through a few of these to show you how you can use them in your business. A simple archetype that everyone will know is the overcoming the monster. It's Beowulf, it's Star Wars, it's the little guy versus the big guy. It's are you a small cafe or a small chain fighting against the multinational corporate greed. It allows you to pit you and your customers against evil on the side of good and take them with you and help you succeed. Rags to Riches is another story. In this case, Charles Dickens Oliver's twist of the orphan that has nothing but then comes good. And for us, that could be helping farmers come from poverty and elevate their income levels. It could be anything to do with growing a business from nothing and building it up to success. Voyage and Return is another one. In this case, Alice Through the Looking Glass. But this is key. We heard it yesterday. People going away to origin to find that bean that they love, the, the roast they want to bring back to their customer, having adventures on the way, trials and tribulations, successes and failures, but eventually coming back and delivering the goods. And that's tied closely into the quest, going out there looking for the Holy Grail, the Indiana Jones. How are we going out and finding something and bring it back, bringing it back? Is it that special coffee? Is it the relationship? And as I'm going through these, hopefully you can see how these would fit into your business and the difference between putting information on a coffee bar about the, the altitude and the type of bean and the roast compared to the story behind it, who produced it, where did it come from, how did you meet them, what challenges did you overcome to get there. Another example is comedy. In this case, not necessarily the ha-ha, funny joke type of comedy, but things that get repeatedly put in your way before you can get to your destination. So in terms of planes, trains and automobiles, Essentially, car crashes and missing trains aren't funny, but not getting able to get home for Christmas is funny. And in the Shakespearean sense, comedy often ends up with two unlikely people getting married. And in specialty coffee, two businesses getting together, the, uh, the business mergers and acquisitions, different companies coming together, that can be seen as a comedy. And then, of course, tragedy. Tragedy is, is a popular archetype for storytelling. It's on the front pages of our papers every day. It allows us, maybe it allows us to feel a bit better about ourselves because we know there are people who are worse off, but it's quite a compelling archetype, a compelling way of telling a story. And for us, there is tragedy in the world, and often specialty coffee is touched by it in terms of people's lives. And what we can do is we can take our customers with us and allow them to see the change they can make, see the difference they can make to people's lives. And then we can morph that into rebirth. In this case, it's uh, Scrooge, the commercially grumpy old man that didn't like Christmas and saw the error of his ways. But for us, we can turn tragedy into rebirth in terms of overcoming hostile environments or overcoming issues and then creating good out of them. So those are those seven structures I was talking about. But there's one more that I think you might find quite interesting. This is called the Pixar archetype. And this was put together by a woman called Emma Coates who used to write for Pixar. And she'd noticed a pattern in their storylines. And in the Pixar context, it could be once upon a time, there was a toy called Woody. Every day, his owner Andy played with him because he was his favorite toy. One day, Buzz Lightyear came along and Woody was no longer the favorite. Because of that, Woody pushed Buzz out of the window. Because of that, Buzz got taken off and the toys went out to rescue him until finally he was brought home and everyone realized Andy loved them. And that creates a flow and a narrative that you can follow. In our industry, it might be something different. It might be, once upon a time, there was a talented barista. She realized that coffee making coffee was her calling, so she worked every day to be the best barista she could. Every day, she went in early, she trained, she got better and better. Then one day, she entered a regional barista competition. Because of that, she worked harder and harder perfecting her routine, researching, getting better and better, often sleeping overnight in the cafe so that she could open up the next morning. Because of that, she ended up going to Dublin, to the World Barista Championships. She'd never been before and she was nervous, but she'd left her hometown for the first time and she knew she could do it, until finally the day arrived. She was so nervous before the demo she could hardly speak, but once she started, everything went perfectly. The event ended, she was waiting for the judge's results, and then she realized, well, I'll let you finish that one. So you can, 
You can see how narratives tie people in. They get you involved. And that's the strength of narratives. So what I'd like to do today is, is leave you with a challenge. Ask yourselves, what's your story? Ask yourselves who your customers are and how they respond to stories. What are they interested in? Do you know what they like? How can you tie them in? How can you elevate your business and your company away from the mundane and the prosaic to something fantastic? How can you get above the noise and mean something? And I'd like to ask you, what's your story? Thank you.